Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I've been a long time member of uh, MicroFocus coming in uh, from the HP acquisition and prior uh, Mercury Interactive, as uh, some of you in the crowd may still remember. Uh, but a long time history uh, with the business uh, across the different functions. Today, I get the uh, opportunity and honor of uh, leading the application delivery management business. Uh, which is uh, mostly focused on helping uh, you, our customers, accelerate your application delivery uh, really without compromising on quality or introducing too much risk uh, around that area. Uh, and over the next uh, 25 minutes or so, we'd like to share with you a bit about our strategy, uh, what we're seeing in the market, uh, and where are we investing our engineering resources. Uh, we're also happy to share a bit um, uh, overall, our own Agile and DevOps transformation uh, and kind of the key uh, practical lessons we've learned. Uh, so I would, uh, I'll be happy to share kind of our, our uh, guidebook for a uh, large and complex enterprises trying to go through this uh, transformation uh, and share with you what we've learned and what, the, what our suggestions would be. And I would say uh, each and, uh, and every one of us, whether us as a software vendor, but uh, I would say every industry and every one of our customers, no matter which industry, uh, healthcare, financials, uh, oil and gas, everybody is really uh, looking at, at uh, the world of uh, digital transformation today and understanding uh, that the customer experience of, of uh, your services and your applications uh, uh, really has to be super modern. Uh, employees are used to having their online banking apps is, uh, is cool mobile. Uh, they're used to Facebook. They don't want their internal IT application to look like they're 10 or 20 years old. Um, so there's an immense pressure on the customer experience. Um, and we also see it each, each of our customers in their own industry and in their own competitive landscape. But uh, we see more and more of, of the competition these days uh, being managed uh, or being run on the digital uh, front ends and the digital arenas. Um, so you have uh, healthcare providers today not competing on the, on the quality of their doctors, but where can you get actually a, an online meeting with your doctor? Where could you get your lab results online, etc.? Uh, we, we see COVID uh, these days also drastically accelerating uh, the competitive landscape of the digital a front end is a, a, whether it's a, a customers or employees or citizens are a lot less, um, a, or actually we would we usually would prefer performing a, a actions a digitally versus going a, physically to a place, a, and that's where a lot of the competitive a, battleground happens today. And and the third piece is really regulation, and whether you're a pharmaceutical or whether you're a bank or whether you're a software company. Uh, we're all uh, going through and having to meet uh, endless amounts of regulations, uh, and this puts pressure again on the on the application side, whether it's from uh, making sure you're GDPR compliant or secure, uh, or able to conform to the standards in uh, in uh, in key areas um, that you're required to based on country and where where you're operating. Uh, in an ideal world, you know, you could uh, go ahead and say, great, I have great uh, uh, justifications for enormous IT budgets because I have to get a great customer experience and we have to be competitive. Um, but, you know, we, we see in many cases in reality, uh, customers are facing uh, tough challenges. Uh, and it's tough challenges in the way organizations are structured or were historically structured. Um, uh, and, and many of our customers, uh, just as us, have gone through massive transformation on the team structure. Uh, we had a you know huge central QA organization that we had to blow up uh, and basically roll uh, into the uh, core agile teams. Uh, you know we, we probably overdid it in the first round, uh, and we actually centralized back uh, performance testing and security testing. Uh, but I would say overall, the quality management aspects and the functional testing aspects are uh, have gone into the, the core Agile team's responsibility. Uh, and we also have uh, every team almost or every line of business adopting a different set of tools uh, and building out an Agile tool chain, a DevOps tool chain. Uh, but we're seeing more and more organizations with huge amount of, of uh, tooling 
uh, around their software development and delivery lifecycle, uh, which which makes it a challenge to when you want to try and move faster and when you want to try and govern. Uh, and um, and uh, these are you know creating a lot of complexities around the tools. Uh, if I look at the environments, which is another key topic that we got a lot of complexity around, uh, if in the past, you know, you had to uh, run your testing and you had to um, cover a set of environments, a set of browsers, a set of operating systems, uh, today uh, we're seeing a, a really enormous amount of environments and the uh, and, uh, and uh, the need to go and test on every operating uh, and every, every operating system, uh, every uh, every type of a uh, mobile device, uh, whether it's every type of browser on a device or on a desktop, uh, enormous amounts of environments that we have to make sure our applications are running on and performing uh, at great quality. Uh, and we also see just the environments that we need to set up for dev and uh, QA uh, become very complicated as you uh, try to uh, um, uh, set these up. And it could be your application is running on premise. It could be running on private cloud. It could be running. Um, it could be running on a, a, a private cloud, public cloud, any type of these environments. And uh, very important to make sure we're able to support all this huge uh, environment support. Uh, and, and a lot of these things are what we are trying to address with our portfolio, uh, building out the innovative solutions and trying to um, work with our customers to make sure we're, we're managing that complex environment. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, you know, if I look at the textbook uh, DevOps, uh, you know, the Phoenix project, uh, the fantasy of uh, having an application uh, with everything that's required to build, test, deploy, and run it embedded uh, as part of system thinking into that application is great if you have a one product, one SaaS product company, or if you're a startup, uh, but you're if you're a very large, complex enterprise, uh, which is the customer base we serve, uh, there is really no magic solution. And, um, and there is a, 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 an ability uh, to actually go and see where are the bottlenecks across uh, reality today in order to accelerate. Uh, and very specifically, uh, if I look at, at the different areas, our customers having not one or two, but hundreds uh, of, of, uh, of applications running in IT. And they need to manage all of them and in coordination. And some of the applications may stay a waterfall or may stay on a you know, traditional or legacy a technology stack. Uh, some front ends may move a lot faster. Uh, the mobile app may have updates every two weeks. So, 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 uh, so as we look at the, at the frequency of, of things, and if we look at the complexity across so many different applications, uh, we realize that we actually need to put a lot more evolutionary approach, letting each team and every service or application run in, on its own uh, tooling and pace and really help accelerate uh, each of the pieces standalone based on where the, road, where the bottlenecks and roadblocks are. And whether it's uh, on the backlog side and how do you move from uh, managing a 100-page uh, Word document of requirements uh, and to an agile iterative backlog, uh, whether it's how do you transform uh, uh, the development and testing to be continuous and to be uh, agile. Uh, if uh, you've done your testing very, very fast, but still you're ending up uh, uh, and you're still ending up uh, with the long uh, process that's manual and you have people who actually have to go through hundreds or thousands of tests uh, uh, and do them and run them all manually, uh, uh, then, then uh, it you know, doesn't really help and you're not able to, to pick up the pace. Uh, likewise, if I, I look at deployment and release automation, uh, many times development is finished, they're handing it over the wall to IT for uh, deploying and running, but uh, IT isn't able to run fast enough on the deployment front. Um, 
and and when uh, when this happens you know you're just wasting time of r and d efforts being already spent but uh, you're unable to uh, you're unable to leverage the benefits uh, with these capabilities running in it and this is where we're looking at uh, automating the releases uh, deploying them faster less error prone uh, at much rapid uh, pace uh, uh, really helping out and really the last piece is how do we look at the operations uh, side uh, when it's dynamic workloads when you could leverage public cloud as infrastructure uh, and how do you accelerate that pace there? So I'd say overall, our, our approach here at MicroFocus is, is uh, given your complex Netscape, given all your IT applications, uh, how do you, we, uh, we would uh, like to uh, work with you uh, to remove these bottlenecks, figure out where we can automate and where we can run things faster, uh, whether it's with our own solution or, or the broader ecosystem uh, of, uh, of solutions and product uh, out there. Um, we got three key areas that uh, I'd like to cover, which are kind of my recommendations if when I talk to customers about our transformation and, and what we've learned. Uh, and there are three key things that, that uh, I would say I realize uh, are, are, are important or were very important for us and key customers that we got to work with. Uh, and the first one is really in IT, you have lots of tools, lots of data and source control management tools, test management, defect management, requirements management. And, uh, and all these tools, whether you're standardized in a single process or flow or whether you have a bunch of different tools, um, a lot of our strategy is how do we help you make that work visible? And that's by connecting to, uh, of course, all of the microfocus solutions, but uh, to the broad ecosystem out there. And, and I can give a bunch of examples, but if I look at things, you know, we have integrations with most of the, uh, the common IDEs out there on the source control and configuration management. We have a, a five of our own as part of our portfolio. Uh, PVCS, Dimensions, Accurate, Star Team, but uh, our standard for a next generation Agile DevOps project is Git, uh, GitHub, um, and we have integrations actually across the board to ours, uh, to our competitors, uh, and we can help provide analytics and visibility to what's happening uh, with the source control changes, where are the risks, where are there are areas that we need to focus better on quality. Uh, likewise, we integrate with most uh, automation, uh, automated testing solutions out there, uh, whether it's our own uh, UFT, LoadRunner, um, Fortify uh, for functional performance and security. Uh, but we also integrate with the broader uh, open source uh, uh, ecosystem, uh, whether it's uh, Selenium or JMeter uh, or any others. And we also integrate with many of our competitors as well. Our guide is to, and what we, we, we recommend and see working with customers is the ability to actually get to view across different teams using different tools, possibly different methodologies, uh, really helps them improve, understand where are things moving better and faster and better quality, uh, where are things are challenged and teaching one part of the organization to another. Uh, and of course, closing that loop all the way upstream into PPM, understanding the requirements coming from the business side, managing the, the timelines of the projects and managing the resources and spend, uh, all the way downstream to the service levels in production, where there are incidents, where are there enhancement required, uh, and tying it back to the business uh, on the front end and, uh, and then on the production side uh, while managing uh, as seamlessly as possible the DevOps tool chain. Uh, and we realize that, the, and we found that uh, one of the biggest factors in driving change in the organization and getting the organization to uh, adopt Agile and be able to scale it is, uh, is setting the right KPIs and metrics uh, to each of the personas uh, that take part in that process. Uh, and whether it's on the product management side that is trying to track the value um, and, and you can we using a, a product um, uh, as a term here, a, a, big, a big transition we've seen over the last few years with IT is a, a move from uh, managing projects in IT to realization that these are actually products. Uh, because any project in IT may have a start date, but 
rarely there's an end date by which a project is completed and the service up and running forever. Uh, but any new application, any new service, uh, usually would go on sometimes for decades. Uh, so the concept of, of taking this and moving from project into product view in IT as well uh, is picking up pace. We've definitely uh, adopted this uh, internally, uh, but we are seeing many successful customers taking that approach. Uh, and then we can have kind of the product owners or the, the application owners, the responsibility to really tracking and looking at the uh, usage perspective, at the usability, at the impact. Uh, that uh, that service or application is delivery. Uh, there's a set of KPIs around quality, around delivery, around reliability. Uh, and again, this is just a subset of key objectives and you know, we'll be happy to set up a, a time post this event and share with you our own internal KPIs and how we're measuring them. Um, but we found that each KPI, if done the right way, could actually drive behavior change. Uh, so for example, while we have you know, hundreds of, of, of products and uh, many of them are in different tools that are customized even differently. Uh, we started measuring, measuring uh, the escape defects or how many defects that are discovered in an iteration are not uh, fixed in that iteration, but are rather pushed for later releases. Uh, and we found it's a great indicator of how agile um, a team is. Uh, and it doesn't really matter if the sprint is two weeks, four weeks, a quarter, as long as you're able to discover in an iteration, fix it, verify it, and deploy the change, it's a good indication of your agility. If most of the defects ended up being pushed for later releases, you end up with some kind of a waterfall where you know you finish implementation, you have a huge backlog of, of defects that you need to fix, and that does get you back into a waterfall structure. So I won't go through all the different KPIs right now, but I would uh, I, I would say that's a key area that we found helps customer uh, scale agile and scale into DevOps and, and drive behavior beyond just you know organizational structure uh, and mode of operations. Um, if I look at the um, um, these are some of the KPIs that were able in the dashboards. Uh, that you could look at uh, from Octane, uh, which we, of course, use internally uh, across MicroFocus. Uh, most of our teams are, are leveraging Octane. Uh, and here you could see some of the analytics and, and value that you could get as a customer uh, from connecting the different systems together. Uh, and whether it's analyzing the risk on different areas of the application, uh, as we have algorithms to, to analyze the risk around commits, uh, in, at, at very high level, our, you know, our software can analyze your application areas and then uh, can identify a single application area. I had 10 different people check in code uh, to that same area. It would probably a lot more risky than if you had the same 10 people check in those code changes into 10 different areas of the application, uh, just because probability of them, you know, stepping on each other and and uh, and. Uh, creating defects or issues uh, drastically grows. Um, so any, any analytics that really helps a guide on where would be the risk, where you should focus on quality, uh, as well as understanding the quality levels by application area. Uh, and you could see the middle chart there, and, and, and really it can it very easily, you could really, you know, with one view, uh, you can understand what are my problematic application areas, where do I have a lot of changes, where do I have a lot of defects, uh, and then understanding I need to shift resources or focus to these areas. Likewise, we can track the ongoing move from manual to automation on the testing front. Uh, we can both help guide on which manual tests have been running very frequently and bring up issues, uh, and which are um, uh, run only once in a while to help guide and coach in how you automate and the which applications you would want to automate, uh, any and many other analytics. I won't go through all of them uh, in these uh, 30 minutes, uh, but we'll be happy to to do follow-ups with, with any of you. Uh, we found, uh, you know, we would assume every sprint the uh, engineering team would work on the top uh, key backlog items that would agree. Uh, once we started tracking it with a, a chart like the one you have on the top right, uh, we realized actually R&D was checking in and touching code 
for a hundred other different reasons, uh, technology debt, uh, re-architecting pieces, not necessarily on the top priorities, uh, backlog items. So it also became a, a, a very good way for us to get visibility and how to manage the engineering process. Uh, and even more so during COVID days when everybody's working from home and you get much less visibility uh, into actually what the engineers are working on, uh, these types of analytics uh, really help provide visibility to the ongoing work uh, and understanding where you need to, to put focus, etc. Uh, if I uh, move next to the second area or recommendation is, is customers uh, try to scale to Agile and DevOps, uh, and it's really about automation. Uh, and I would say the natural automation definitely for us is around automating functional testing, performance testing, security testing. Uh, and we've seen uh, that you could actually make huge moves and shifts around these things. Uh, we moved uh, the uh, performance testing, for example, to be very iterative. Every build, we run a small load test. Uh, versus waiting to an end of a release and realizing we have too many architectural challenges uh, and way too much efforts now to fix things. But if an engineer got the feedback a day after he checked in that this would cause 1% uh, performance segregation, uh, they could immediately look if this is intended, if this is a defect, if there's a way to improve it. Uh, likewise, on the functional testing side, heavily invested with AI and computer vision capabilities, uh, that help drive uh, uh, automation uh, in a much simpler way, in a way a human would. Uh, so the, the automated scripts are a lot more resilient. If you know, if an icon changes, the color moves from one place to another, uh, you know, traditional automation scripts would fail. Um, our computer vision algorithms can actually recognize it's still the same object and would know how to navigate to it. Uh, so really, how do we automate uh, everything that's happening on every pipeline, understanding uh, whether it's a unit test or a, or a functional test or end-to-end -end testing, whether it's understanding if a build fails uh, or if a test fails, what is the reasons for these? Uh, so you could get a lot more visibility um, uh, into your processes and how you could accelerate. Uh, we also put a lot of efforts in automating the uh, environments for development and testing and staging, uh, where we uh, the, all of the environment provisioning, uh, whether it's for development, for system integration testing, user acceptance testing, you know, core production and staging, uh, all of these environments we have centrally managed, uh, automatically provisioned. Uh, so we don't end up with uh, engineering checked on that environment and it works fine, but QA was working on a different environment and were there failures. And then when they deploy to production, deploy it in the production environment even looks different and things failed there. So really a lot of automation to help accelerate that uh, the pace. And then the third piece is really around aligning the strategy and execution uh, across the organization. Uh, and, and here, really, the goal is to, to look at uh, you know, what is a business asking and then ability to map everything that's happening downstream to meet that demand, uh, whether it's design up front, whether it's engineers implementing, QA testing, deploying, updating, monitoring, all the work around an application at the end of the day has cost, has timeline, and we found that the more you are able to bring that uh, uh, visibility into the business and manage the value stream downwards from you know, a backlog item or requirement to all the efforts, all the spend, all the cost, all the time being put into delivery, it uh, actually makes a, a lot better uh, business decisions and can help remove bottlenecks or move things that are stuck uh, in this process definitely as they are uh, prioritized. Uh, we had huge benefits for implementing these three strategies, uh, whether it's really accelerating the pace of our engineering, uh, drastically reducing our defects, uh, so much higher quality applications. Uh, and in terms of outages for our SaaS, we managed to reduce that in about 50% of the downtime, uh, which is very significant given the amount of nines uh, we're delivering. 
Uh, so really lots of positive results, both internally at MicroFocus as well as uh, with our customers as we are working with them on uh, scaling Agile and DevOps across the enterprise. Uh, for those of you, and I'm sure you're all aware, uh, collecting up the word, the fifth word is outcomes. Uh, and you've got a few more uh, to go, but there's uh, great prizes at the end. And um, with that, I'll summarize a bit on uh, two points. One is really uh, some of our learnings with COVID. Uh, the lockdown days actually has taught us a lot uh, for the better or worse. Uh, I think there's huge benefit. I think there's also lots of challenges. Uh, if I look at the benefits, um, we realize that we have to depend a lot more on, on data. And you can't really get the gut feel when uh, that you do when you walk around the cubes or when you uh, have a whole conversation with others on the quality levels, on the risk levels, on the timelines. Uh, so you actually have to rely on data that sits in systems that is, uh, you know, bulletproof in many cases in order to make decisions. Uh, we got to see a huge benefit in global meetings as uh, instead of having a people, you know, a team in the room and a bunch of a few people dialing in. And now we have everybody uh, on, with a video on, on the same playing field. Uh, and I would say any, you know, distributed global meeting is a hundred times more effective this way. Um, I would say still there are challenges with the ongoing local R&D sites that uh, are, are very used to having these meetings around the table. Uh, we saw um, productivity. I, th I think actually since I built this slide, we've learned a bit more. I would say overall we heard a uh, no interrupts, no time commuting. Uh, this lockdown is great because we could be a lot more efficient. Uh, today, some more analysis. We think, uh, and again, it's still early on, but I would say we see top performers who are actually able to be a lot more productive given they have less interruptions, less as people asking them for advice or help, um, and they're self-sufficient. So they've been running a lot faster than they did in the office. Uh, on the other hand, we see kind of the, the lower bar of, of, of the team uh, struggling a lot more without the coaching, without the guidance. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot more difficult for them to definitely for new employees or people ramping up uh, to, uh, to get on board. Uh, and it did help us uh, or force us to uh, focus on a smaller set of priorities uh, versus spreading ourselves uh, thin. Uh, I think the downside, if I look at the, the data, is great, but it can also mask uh, many things. Uh, it's a lot slower sometimes to respond. Uh, if I have an engineer going on the wrong track to solve something uh, in the office, it's much easier to, to find it and you know get him back into course. Uh, I think when everybody's at home, it's much harder to manage it, track uh, and there's not necessarily enough data on ongoing basis to help us do these uh, quick shifts. Uh, we have everybody complaining that they're in front of Zoom or Teams for nine hours a day, and, and definitely the amount of meetings uh, exponentially grew. Uh, and I believe the the team uh, leaders, definitely the, at the at the individual at the small team or group level. Uh, are feeling a lot more pressure on how to keep the teams engaged, working together, uh, keeping the team spirit. Uh, and this is where without the personal connection long-term, we'll have to reinvent something because it, it's pretty hard to sustain it um, across the screens of, the, of Teams and Zoom. So I'll end up with a kind of our my key recommendations here as you're looking into scaling Agile and DevOps. Uh, I'd say one, um, avoid rip and replace everything with everything because uh, it's these things are um, very expensive and rarely deliver the outcomes promised. Uh, I would say look at the set of metrics across the functions uh, that you want to align to and they will also drive behavior change. Uh, automate anywhere you can on the testing side, on the provisioning side, deployment side. Um, uh, really important to keep up the pace. Uh, and then the last piece is really make sure there's a clear alignment between what the business is asking for 
and all the efforts, uh, headcount, monetary, whatever it may be to implement these business requirements, uh, it does help prioritize and focus and manage, manage better uh, both the teams as well as the budgets. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. My uh, email is rafi at microfocus.com. Uh, if you'd like to have further discussion on any of the topics I just uh, walked through, uh, please reach out. Uh, we'll be very happy to continue this conversation, whether it's myself, whether it's my team. Uh, you know, engineers love to talk to other engineers, so we'll be very happy to get you in front of our uh, my R&D VP. Uh, who could who's doing these things in practice uh, and he could share what he learned struggled uh, but overall our team is available for you